Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 136. How do you start packaging your code with PyProjectTOML? Would you like to join a conversation that gently walks you into setting up your Python projects to share? This week on the show, Christopher Trudeau is here, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We discuss a recent code conversation featuring Real Python team members Ian Curry and Ger Arna Hiela. The video dives into the officially sanctioned way to configure your project using a PyProject TOML file. We cover how this relatively new method will help you package your code for use on your system or for sharing with others. Christopher shares a real Python tutorial about using Pathlib to get a list of all files within a directory. We're both fans of Pathlib and how it simplifies working with file paths. This tutorial digs into methods to recursively list all directory contents or create a conditional listing. We share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including the explanation of Python bytecode, why always to use closed open intervals, a discussion about building the monolith before microservices, how to parse natural language time and date expressions, and a project for posting on Mastodon. The InfluxDB time series platform empowers developers and organizations to build real-time IoT, analytics, and cloud applications with timestamp data. Learn more and start for free at influxdata.com. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher. Welcome back. Hey, good to be here. Hey, I'm excited to dive in today. We are bypassing the news segment and digging right into some articles. And so what do you got first? So this first one is a general programming article, and not Python specific, and it's called Always Used Closed Open Intervals. And it's by Fernando Hurtado Cardenas. And it explains why in most programming languages, when you specify a range, the pattern for specifying the range has a closed interval at the bottom and an open one at the top. So in Python, if you actually think of the range object, function. It's not really a function, but let's not get into that. <laughs> sure. So if you actually think about that, it, uh, if you do say range 0, 0,5, you get from 0 to 4. So the pattern is including items in the range that are greater than or equal to the bottom part, but only less than the top part of the range. And this pattern shows up in all sorts of places. In Python, you see it, like I said, in the range function, in list slices. In JavaScript, you see it in array slicing. In Java, there's a list sublist method. Even in SQL, the limit operator works the same way. So if you ever sort of wondered why, and I hadn't until the, he asked the question. <laughs> yeah. But this article explains it. And so his first explanation for why you want to do this is so that you can easily specify empty intervals. Mm. So if you think about range 0, 0, that's empty, right? That makes sense. Well, if you'd used a closed, closed pattern instead, that wouldn't work. The upper boundary would actually have to be less than the lower boundary in order to specify empty and that's uh, kind of weird looking, right? Yeah, and inverted kind of looking. Yeah, thing. yeah. It, it would just be like, what? What would zero comma one minus one mean? And that that's, it starts to become messy. And the second, which is kind of a variation on this, but is very is specific to time. If you want to specify a twenty four hour interval, for example, that ends on the hour with closed closed, the upper thing would have to be like minutes or seconds before the interval. Mm. So as an example, let's say we were doing, you know, 2 a.m. to 2 a.m. If you were doing closed closed, you'd have to do 2 a.m. to 159.59 to whatever your resolution is, right? So again, ugly. But closed open allows you to just say 2 a.m. to 2 a.m. Yeah. Okay. That's good. So that comes up often in 
other computing solutions? All over the place. And in fact, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. It's been around for a long time. Uh, so the other thing is this pattern makes it really easy, particularly if you're dealing with integers, to determine the length of the interval. It's just the upper bound minus the lower bound. So back to my range example, 0, 5, the length is 5. It's 5 minus 0. I think I did that right. I didn't even use my fingers. Yeah, so there you go, right? <laughs> so it makes the math nice and easy. So it's not an overly complicated or long article, but I like this kind of thing that sort of drills down on something that you have you know, you see everywhere and have never maybe really otherwise stopped and thought about it. And Fernando closes off by saying that when he was doing the background research for the article, he came across a note from the renowned computer scientist Dijkstra indicating that he favored the closed open pattern at Xerox Park in 1982. And they found that when you use this pattern, your code was simpler and less buggy. So this idea has been around pretty fundamentally for quite some time. And it's you know, one of those things that's kind of hidden inside of programming languages that you never sort of think about before. So it was kind of a neat read. Yeah, that time example was perfect. You know, yeah, and, no, it, that one really, really hit it home for me, right? Because the, yeah. the, the, the you know, 159, 59, 58, or 99, <laughs> or whatever your milliseconds are, is just right. awful, Microseconds. right? Microseconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it can be very messy. Yeah, and this would then be inclusive in that way. And even slicing and other things, that it kind of starts to make sense. It, initially, it's it's a, a bit of a barrier for a beginner. I, and that's, that's I think, the one challenge. Uh, I, I was actually doing uh, some teaching for a, for a very, very intro course to Python this week. And, you know, the, the, the whole, it always, as a, a programmer who's been doing it forever, right, the, the, the idea of zero indexing, the idea of this kind of stuff, it's like, it's just, this is how it is. You don't question it, right? <laughs> and, then, and then a student goes, but why? And it's like, yeah, well, yeah. because of history and do you really want me to answer questions about doing pointers and memory mapping when we're not trying to cover that? Just, just zero. It starts with zero. Just take yeah. it there and go. <laughs> so, yeah. It's nice to have something short to point to, though, in that yes. sense. That... Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, go read this if you're really interested. <laughs> Check yeah. this out yeah. and let me know if you have questions after it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So my first one is one of these new... <laughs> new things that we've been trying out over, I guess, probably the last six months, maybe even longer at Real Python. We started this idea of what are called code conversations, and I can't really take credit for them. I was probably the biggest critic and, you know, <laughs> person standing in the way of this idea happening at Real Python. And now I am a total fan and I, I, I appreciate the work that Martin and Philip and Ian and all the other people that have been involved in trying to, to move this idea forward. But the idea is to take something that's not an article, but maybe sort of a, a thought or an exercise or a question that came up and dive in and have a conversation about it and tease more material out of it and do it in a bit more of an informal way that keeps it open in a way. There was a recent one. It's kind of funny. Gare Arna was traveling different parts of Europe for different conferences, and he ended up seeing Ian Curry. And while he was visiting him, they decided to record this code conversation, decided to talk about Pi Project Toml, which has been in the news a lot lately with the standard being added to Python 3.11. And the title for the code conversation, which ends up being a video course for us, is... Everyday Project Packaging with Pi Project Toml. I didn't think that would be a mouthful, but it ended up being one. And in the code conversation, you're going to learn how to package a project. But kind of, you might think of it like as a small project, somewhere to get started. In this case, they're using a, a little CLI project that you type in something and it, it kind of creates this graphical thing. And, you know, it's kind of like a standard smaller CLI Python script that you may want to do. And they take it from that small starting point and then move it all the way to how do you package it? How do you create this PyProject Toml file? How do you get it all the way to the point where you can install it on your machine using pip and why that's good and how that allows you to use that code in other places, maybe in your own installation of Python. And along the way, you learn about this sort of history of packaging. Gerarna is one of the resident people on our team that's been using Python the longest and has a lot of history that he kind of shares in it. If you weren't aware, <laughs> Python is old. <laughs> it's before the internet old, uh, conceived in the late 1980s. And so 
the idea of sharing code and packaging is something that had to be adapted to the language. And as we've probably talked ad nauseum about it, it, there's been so many different ways that people have looked at how to do that and what are successful or unsuccessful things and so forth. And how can we standardize it has been this sort of rallying cry. As Python's advanced, the sharing of code has become more and more common. They talk about demonstrating this relatively new and now officially sanctioned way of doing it. And I really like that there's like a set of benefits you get out of it. The code conversation's about 50 minutes long. It's, I would say, one of the most gentle (laughs) sort of ways to get introduced into packaging and the concepts and nice ways to understand with a whole bunch of resources for you to jump off and go further with, you know, links to the sites. They spend time talking about not only the history that I mentioned, but also why it's important to be able to call your project from anywhere, being able to have consistent imports, having a single file that might be able to work across multiple build systems, and then structuring files and folders correctly, understanding the different ways that you can run your script, and then exploring some of the background behind the packaging world that's out there and why the standard is good for that. They talk about the setup tools and how to use that. So I just found it a really great resource. And I talked to Dan and, you know, normally we share like a preview of one of these code conversations or one of our courses because they're for our subscribers. But we thought, well, this is a really great resource that if someone isn't familiar with the types of content that you can get from real python beyond the articles and maybe these snippets or beginning parts of some of these video courses maybe we could share this as a complete thing because it really is a complete structure and i had no idea how i could cut it <laughs> apart and have it be something that someone can walk away and say hey i got something out of this because it was really just getting going about 20 minutes in and so forth so it's available on youtube as the complete thing and if you're not familiar with the fact that we have a real python youtube channel and i want to say hello to all the people that listen to the real python podcast on youtube it still surprises me that that's a common way but i'm always listening to podcasts on the go so i use a podcast app but i know that it's popular and i see you guys out there and i see what you're saying and so forth but we put out every week snippets of some of our courses and you know please check out the youtube channel if you haven't yet and this is a great resource that's in its entirety on there and then it links back to some of the resources back on realpython.com to learn more so check it out it's again everyday project packaging with pi project Tommel, and i'll include links in the show notes not only to the course page where you can see it formatted and how it's kind of divided up normally and then um, i'll include also the the youtube link so you can check it out in its entirety there as sort of a holiday gift <laughs> uh, the the packaging stuff is it, it's a mess yeah yeah <laughs> and, and and the community has slowly been trying to get it under control uh, the uh, my most recent package that i published up until now i've been using a fairly old mechanism for doing it so just a couple months ago i put out a new one and i decided okay i'm going to experiment it's very it was a tiny little uh, open source thing Part of my exercise was I'm going to do this a modern way. So it was the first one where I'd actually used PyProject, Toml, and uh, some of the newer mechanisms for doing it. And there were a couple things where I was like, I, I found that I was trying to fight because I was trying to keep my old way and I gave up and I'm like, okay, I'll just do it the way it says. And it's, it all worked magically if you follow the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some good templates there. <laughs> and what I found is that the the internet is not helpful because, because this is such an ongoing thing. Everyone's got an opinion and it's often, often hard to find from an article what the date of the article is. So like you get a little piece yeah. of advice and you'll try it and you're like, and that doesn't work. And that's because it's it turns out it was five years old. So yeah, but a big resource for me just as a shout out, is one of our fellow real Pythoners is uh, Dane Hillard, and he's got a new book coming out called yeah. Publishing Python Packages. It's in early release, but it is available in electronic form online. We can uh, include a link, and it's a great deep dive. It covers this and you know how to integrate testing and all these other pieces that you need to know if you're trying to share these kinds of things with other people. 
So, uh, and it's nice that it's all in one place and, uh, you know, it works from top to bottom and you've got the sample code. So uh, I found it much more helpful than, you know, trying to figure that out for myself on the internet because the internet has, this is one of those places where there's too many answers and it's hard to figure out whether or not uh, you're reading the right one. Yeah. Yeah. Dane's been on the show a couple of times. We talked about that book and his process in, in writing it. And then he's also been on the show to talk about this concept of becoming more of a Python professional and what that involves as far as like, you know, structuring code and moving beyond you know, working as an individual and working in an organization that led to a much deeper conversation in uh, about build systems that I have coming out next week with Benji from Pants Build, which is a really neat system. And so uh, lots of interconnectivity there. But yeah, I'd love to give another shout out to Dane and, and his, his new book. And so we'll include the link for it there. Are you building real-time applications? Check out InfluxDB, time series platform. InfluxDB is optimized for developer productivity. So developers can build IoT, analytics, and cloud applications quickly and at scale. With its data collectors and scripting languages, a common API across the entire platform, and highly performant time series engine and storage, InfluxDB makes it easy to build once and deploy across multiple products and environments, at the edge, on-prem, or in the cloud. Check it out and start for free at InfluxData.com. That's I-N-F-L-U-X-D-A-T-A dot com. What's your next one? So this is my real Python article for the week, and uh, it's by Ian Curry, and it's called How to Get a List of All Files in a Directory with Python. And the title kind of says it all. Uh, what it actually leaves out is the article focuses on using Pathlib. If you're still using the OS module for doing path-like stuff in Python, and if you're using a more recent version than I think it's Python 3.4 when this was introduced, you should switch to Pathlib. It's a superior library. It treats paths as objects rather than as pure strings. And I find when I use it, my code's less error prone. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I, one of the things I like, and it's, it's a silly little thing, but it overloads the slash operator so that when you can compose the objects together, the objects look like paths. And that's far more readable than os.path.join. So it, it, it makes, uh, it's one of the few places where operator overloading actually is an improvement. Usually it's something I try to avoid, but... Uh, I like how it does that with the slashes that it'll yeah. work um, on Windows or Mac. You don't have to worry about yes. like, oh my God, which direction? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. It helps that as well. So the article uh, begins by showing you how to create a path object and then uh, quickly moves to the iter dir method. And as you might guess from the name, iter dir is a generator. And when you iterate over it inside, say, a for loop, you get a new path object for each file in a directory, as in iterate over the directory. So if you pass in, you know, uh, the path for documents, you'll get all the files and directories inside of documents. So a common pattern is to look for just files or just, just directories. And so it shows you how to use the isFile or isDir methods, respectively, allowing you to perform operations, you know, condition operations inside of the for loop so that you could do something with just the files or just the directories. And if you wanted to see the entire tree below that path, you're going to have to write a recursive function to sort of drill down into those. That can be a little messy sometimes. And so the article talks about an alternative, which is something called rglob. So a glob is a file pattern specifier. So on the command line, when you say star.txt, for example, that's a glob, the star.txt. So the path object has both a glob and an rglob method that allow you to look for files according to patterns. And the rglob variant is recursive, meaning it'll go down into those subfolders. Nice. The ultimate glob is star, which specifies everything. So back to my example of finding all the children in a file tree, you simply call our glob and pass in star. And that gives you a path generator, and it goes not just the immediate directory, but everything underneath it. The article then goes on to show you some example glob patterns and what they can do for you, as well as how to use the built-in function filter to iterate over a subset of directories based on a Boolean conditions. So you can use something like is file along with filter and look at just the files inside of that glob piece. 
So finally, the article goes back to that recursive mechanism that I spoke about before, showing you how to write a much more complicated file listing filter that allows you to do things like pass in a list of subdirectories to skip. So this allows you to, say, get a file tree while ignoring things like temp or log directories. Nice. So it's a neat little article. And, and if, you're, if you're not familiar with Pathlib, this is a great place to, to start. And to round all this out, there's a new real Python course that came out just a few days ago called Using Python's Pathlib Module by Darren Jones. Delves into everything Pathlib. So if you want to go more than just the file iteration, this is a great resource to go off and see that as well. Yeah, behind the scenes, we had a little conversation. I'm trying to think who brought it up. It was Martin or somebody. But they were saying do you think we have too many things about Pathlib coming out? (laughs) And yeah, just be aware that there's a handful of uh, other things kind of coming along. And um, I don't, I don't think it's bad to, you know, have a little focus on it for a little while. Yeah, it's Pathlib week at RealPython. There's nothing wrong with that. (laughs) Celebrate. Welcome. (laughs) Join the path. (laughs) Awesome. So my next one I was very intrigued to see this kind of come up and to see lots of different things about it. And so I I don't want to spoil the meat of it because I I think reading the article and working through the code uh, are something that you should do and practice if you're interested in, in getting into this. And it's sort of an article slash GitHub repo by Michael Mosier. The title is Python Byte Code Explained, but that's just a portion of this larger project that Michael has, which is an advanced course on Python 3. And that gets into lots of other things like decorators and other areas of Python that a lot of people would say are advanced. So again, I'm not going to do a super deep dive into how it really works because it's very, very technical and helps to really look at the code, hence why kind of showing it. But the idea is to use some tools to look at how Python code is actually operating and it helps to really explain complex things like decorators or I have had conversations with a handful of other people about this and it's been kind of a journey if you've been along on the ride. Back in episode 39, I was talking about generators and coroutines and learning Python through exercises. So it was the title of it with Reuven Learner and Reuven uses this a bunch, this disassemble feature that's built into Python, where you can have it show you the bytecode kind of printed out. And uh, you import DIS, you can use that command, say, in a REPL type session, dis.dis, and then put in the parentheses the name of a function. And it'll go through and show you how that bytecode would operate. It's very fascinating to kind of look at and a real neat way if you're the type of person who (laughs) we were having this conversation before we started about this idea that people in a classroom setting very often will ask very complex background questions or actually we mentioned it earlier on in our questions of like uh, the open and closed and how you might want to send somebody off to a different resource i think this is a great way to say hey well why don't you try this out and try it as a self-learning tool to sort of dig through that. Unfortunately, there's some vocabulary that you need to understand. And Michael has created a tool to help with that, that kind of explains some of it and then provides links back to the the common resource, which is the Python documentation, docs.python.org. And if you look up DIS, the disassembler for Python bytecode, it then has definitions for all the different types of objects and what you're you're seeing inside there then sort of not only the analysis functions but all the names of all the different bytecode instructions these things that are names like opcode and argval and all kinds of interesting things like pop top and so it dives into the structure of I'll read a couple paragraphs from his thing python's an interpreted language When a program is run, the Python interpreter is first parsing your code and checking for any syntax errors, which we've talked about. (laughs) Then it's translating the source code into a series of bytecode instructions, and then the bytecode instructions are what are run by the Python interpreter. This text is explaining some of the features of the Python bytecode. And then later on, and I'll cover another paragraph that he goes into, the bytecode deals with two entities, a memory store that keeps functions and data items and 
and a stack used for evaluating expressions. The stack is maintained separately per each function. The Python interpreter works as a stack machine when it evaluates bytecode instructions, and this means that values are moved from a main memory store to the stack where the expression is evaluated. Then the result is moved back to main memory. And that probably, if you had listened to episode 124, where we were exploring recursion with Al Swigart, we talked a lot about the stack and how recursion can be messy because it'll keep throwing things on the stack again and again and again and again and not evaluating them, not removing them from the stack. And hence the term that you've maybe heard of stack overflow or it overflowing, and that would crash your program. And so here's yet another example of of this sort of under the hood stuff working. I just dug this article. I thought it was really well done. But again, as a research tool to kind of learn more what's happening Michael built a set of tools, and it's this is actually part of that package on GitHub. Uh, he has this thing called Pi ASM tool, and inside of it, he created a prettifier, this pretty DIS, <laughs> which when it prints it out, it removes some of the extra code, but also provides a little more detail on the line number and you know what actually is being called at this point in say that function or whatever. And then there's like this true false flag where you can have links for that directly back to the Python docs in the disk page I was mentioning earlier. This repo goes through learning by looking at disassembled code, learning and expression evaluation. And then he has examples of function calls, loops, classes, dictionaries, and lists. This is definitely one of these things that I would use to kind of learn a little bit more. I've been interested in bytecode and kind of what's happening and sort of understanding what's happening at the bottom level, all this stuff. And uh, I've talked to multiple guests. Uh, The other guest I've mentioned before is Brett Cannon, and we've talked about his Unraveling Python Syntax series. And a note on that, Brett is done. He's done it. (laughs) He's finished unraveling it. And uh, his most recent article which I thought was funny, is called MVPy, the Minimum Viable Python, in over 29 posts spanning two years. This is the final post in my blog series, Python Syntactic Sugar. So it's been interesting to kind of see how sometimes in his unraveling, he would go into the bytecode and explain some of the stuff that's happening. But generally in his unraveling, he was very often using Python to sort of explain Python which is interesting in in and of itself. Like, you know, what is the core elements of it? I applaud Michael's work here. I I think it's a a really good resource if you want to learn a little more about it and some nice little tools um, and also kind of a neat way for you to dig in and learn a little bit more about what's happening under the hood with Python. Man, one of my favorite examples of this, and it often comes up when you're dealing with multiprocessing uh, threads and sort of parallelism yeah. uh, frequently, and we see it in the comments in our articles and courses, It's uh, there's a single line of Python. How can that single line be a race condition, right? Uh, because it's only a line. So how can I get a race condition out of only a line? And, and the answer to that is disassemble the line. It's not one thing. It might be four things. And that's oh, yeah. why you have a race condition because one thread is halfway through those two, the first two and the other thread starts and that messes with things. So it, it's one of those places where as you're getting deeper into the understanding of how these pieces fit and, and what it looks like, you know, I, I don't think you, you, no one's ever going to write the byte code, but understanding unless you're getting deep into, you know, the compiler and, and contributing to, right. you know, to CPython itself, but understanding a little bit about how these pieces work. And this circles back to the conversation we had in uh, yeah, a, a couple episodes back about the uh, the optimizer that was added to 3.11, yes. which is adding new byte codes here. And, it's, and it does some dynamic replacement of those byte codes in order to give you speed up. So having an understanding of where where these pieces are, if you're getting deeper into the language, can uh, benefit you know your how how fast your code is and and tricky little bugs like uh, like race conditions. Yeah, it's always been one of these things where I, I'll see something and be kind of confused by it and kind of do that self journey. And this one with bytecode, it's there's this whole set of vocabulary that <laughs> it's like, well, what does all that mean? And kind of understanding it and slowly seeing it unfold. And uh, I think this is a nice introduction to that if if you need a place to learn it. 
And if you want to become a language geek, uh, these kinds of stack-based machines are used in other virtual machines. Java's uh, mechanisms are, are identical. And some assembly languages actually work this way as well. So this isn't something that you know Python invented. This is, uh, this is an old wrench that is used commonly. <laughs> at, uh, it's just at a lower level than most people code at. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's about a topic we touch on this week, working with files and directories using Pathlib. The course is based on a real Python tutorial by Ger Arna Hiela. And in the video course, Darren Jones takes you through how to work with file paths in Python, reading and writing files in new ways, manipulating paths, and how to pick out and work with individual components of a path, how to move and delete files, and listing files and iterating over them. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to manage files and paths in Python. And Pathlib will help you do that in an elegant, readable, and Pythonic way. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections, and where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. We uh, have a discussion topic this week. It's kind of funny how it kind of came up. We were thinking about, well, what should we talk about this week? And then you're like, well, this might be good. Yeah. So, so normally when we do uh, our discussion about discussions, that sounds very meta, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we usually find something like, you know, Hacker News or Twitter post and, and that where there's a whole bunch of people talking about some opinions and then we weigh in ourselves. And uh, this week instead, we're going to do talking about an article and just weighing in directly. So uh, this is us discussing it and rather than the internet discussing it and us discussing how the internet discussed it. <laughs> Anyways, okay. uh, so the article is by uh, Chris Klug. And uh, as if it's not confusing enough to have two Christophers <laughs> in this conversation. And it's yeah. called Build the Modular Monolith First. And it talks about the pros and cons of monolith and microservice architectures and why Mr. Klug believes you should wait before building a microservice. There is some sample code inside of it. It's not in Python, but it is, you know, it's just basically class definitions and things like that. So it gives you an idea of the structure. Uh, so so as long as you, uh, you know, it, you need to just do a quick little search and replace in your head. Every time you see a brace bracket, think of it as an indent. And every time you see public, just ignore it. <laughs> but the idea is, you know, that you've got a class and users and inheritance and whatever. And he's just talking about the sort of the structure of, uh, you know, the, some code and how you would change it between these two models. And, and where that comes down. Yeah. So in, uh, to give a little bit of background in case folks aren't familiar with monolith and microservice architecture patterns, these are generally opposing approaches to how you put together larger pieces of software. So a monolith is a single program. And in large systems, you might have multiple copies of it running on different servers for redundancy, but it's still a single program. And so technically, any single file script you write is a monolith, but you people don't usually talk about that that way. It's not until you start getting into the bigger things. Yeah. And then uh, opposed to that is when building large systems, you're going to compose your monolith out of modules. This doesn't mean there'll be a single coding file. Then the modules are going to talk to each other, but it's usually directly through calls. So in Python, that would be, you know, import the module and call a function, for example. So your modules could be different files. And in fact, depending on how you're building things, it may end up with different chunks of compile code. So EXEs called DLLs and a whole bunch of other things like that. But fundamentally, all the pieces are together on a single server server and talking to each other over like the memory bandwidth. And instead, by contrast, a microservice architecture is really more of a collection of a series of programs, each of which runs in its own space. And the different programs expose an interface, usually on a network, and respond to calls this way. So if you think about something like Netflix, the interface for playing a movie doesn't have to be tightly coupled with the interface that makes recommendations. So as such, the recommendation engine can be its own thing. And when the UI wants information about what to suggest to you, it queries it and returns that back to you. Okay. So... Microservices are quite popular right now, and a big part of that is because that's what the big boys are doing. So Amazon, Netflix, Google, all those kinds of folks, those who are doing things at the petabyte scale, they're using some variation of this pattern. 
as a result, there's a whole bunch of organizations who are not operating at the petabyte scale, who are doing it because they think they need to. And <laughs> a big part of the article is maybe you don't need to. So the advantage of a microservice, which uh, Mr. Krug talks about in his article, is uh, mostly an organizational one, interestingly, because by being able to build these little independent pieces of software, you can have relatively independent teams working on them. And each piece can be released on its own schedule. And that means deployment can be done faster and you get into all that agile and let's move at speed and all the rest of it. And the disadvantage is now you're in a distributed system. And that comes with a lot of complexity. So you're communicating over a network. It might be fast, but it's never going to be as fast as an in-server call. Right. It might go down. (laughs) There's all that kind of stuff. When you discover a bug, the bug might not be in the place you think it's in. Because let's say you've got a crappy chunk of data. You have to figure out what microservice generated the crappy chunk of data. It might have been a different service than the one where the bug pops up. Mm. And that independence that I talked about that the teams gain, well, it isn't full independence. It's loose coupling. Because if I rewrite my interface and you're calling it and I forget to tell you, both of our services are going to fail. Right. So, So you're adding a whole bunch of complexity and what you get out of it is scale. And what the fundamental question is when you start talking about should I pick one or the other is do you really need that scale? And if not, the premise of the article is start with a well-architected monolith and then when you get to that place, if you get to that place, start pulling pieces of that off and turn those into the services. Okay. Yeah, because I, I think of the testing is one of the big ones that that you kind of already hit on several times as someone who's working on a separate team, let alone communication factors. But as they push an, an update, like how do they test how it integrates with the rest of the system? Yes. And letting people understand that, hey, this is <laughs> is new and, and, and could cause problems and, you know, making sure that, yes, yeah, so I could see that as being way more complicated say, you know, being able to see from modularity, like how things are imported and and used. In a monolithic system, your unit tests can usually get you better confidence on the quality because you're, if you've got, say, like 80% coverage, all the interactions are happening inside of the monolith. So you can treat it a bit like a black box. Uh, In a microservice, you can't. Because I can test the heck out of that single service, but now i got to figure out how the two services interact. And yeah. it's it's possible, but it's very, very tricky to try and figure out code coverage because you're doing coverage of one and then coverage of the other, and you got to figure out how they work together. And usually by the time you've gone down the path, I've never seen a microservice architecture with two services in it. Uh, by the time you've gone down the idea of <laughs> I'm going to do this, it's usually like a dozen. Oh, wow. And uh, so it, it becomes really, really common to sort of wrap them along like an architectural concept, right? So we've got the user management service. We've got the recommendation service. We've got the the S3 bucket wrapping service, whatever the it tends to be services tend to breed services uh, because you don't get the benefit unless they're small. But in order for them to be small, you end up having a lot of them, right? Yeah, okay. Hence the term micro, right? The That's right, yeah. Keeping it small and, and focused in some ways yeah. uh, to that particular job. Even inside of a monolithic structure, would the connections to a database be considered a microservice in that way or is it really it's, not? No, not really. It, it has the same complications. Yeah. Um, and particularly if you're doing a, a monolith at scale where I've got like, say, three or four uh, copies of it running on three or four different servers, you can run into the same kind of problems that I mentioned that, you know, the network goes down or uh, race conditions because two of the servers are asking for something at the same time. So you have locking and problems like that. So at scale, monolith has some of these problems. But I, I guess one of the ways to sort of think about it is, you know, if you're if you're doing a fairly large application and you've got four or five servers talking to one or two databases, that's one level of problem. If I've got 13 microservices to achieve the same thing, <laughs> I've got two or three times that level of problem, right? So you take all that hard stuff, the things that we find challenging in a monolith, and the and the minimum entry to a microservice includes all of that. Mm. So you can have some of the same challenges, but uh, it tends to compound a little bit. 
one of the ways that this is expressed often in, in Python is in sort of the the web component of something like Flask versus Django. And I definitely have heard in or seen lots of sort of materials and tutorials kind of saying, okay, let's use Flask to set up lots of these little microservices. Is that a, a good way to kind of look at it initially to kind of see the complexity? So most microservices are, with the exception of there's, there's specialty ones for doing UI, but for for the for the back end, uh, the vast majority of them in most architectures are going to be uh, talked to through some API. Okay, and that API might be something like REST, and or it might be something like GraphQL. And so then, you know, if you're using something like Django to build it, then you might be using Ninja. If you're using Flask, then you get that out of the out of the box. If Fast API, you get that out of the box. So, so th- these are um, connected things. They're, they're technologies that get used both in this case and in other cases. But if I'm trying to make, you know, let's go back to the recommendation engine example. Yeah. I'm going to have a call that says, okay, uh, what's the user? And the UI is going to call it, and I'm going to return back a list of 10 movies. And I'm going to have a different call that says, oh, uh, Mr. Bailey watched these three things, and I want that information pushed into the recommendation service because it says, oh, I know what else he's watched. So I'm going to add that information to my data. So that's going to be a different call. So the recommendation engine is going to have some sort of API in front of it to try and help you deal with this kind of stuff. And those APIs, like I said, they're often you know REST or, or GraphQL, or there's other ones, other ways of doing it out, out there as well. And that's that's what ties back to things like Ninja or fast API and Flask and all that kind of good stuff. All right. This seems to be a fairly common refrain from people that are been in the industry for a while. I found a couple other resources kind of talking about it. I think the article itself even uses a, a quote but doesn't attribute it. So I looked it up. It was from Martin Fowler. The first law of distributed object design is don't distribute your objects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, that was like, I don't know. I don't know when he wrote it, but he coined this and this article is from like 2014. So, and then the other thing that I saw actually just this morning was a a post. It's from a little while ago, but um, it's from Jason Warner. And it's a tweet thread basically saying, I'm convinced that the one of the biggest architectural mistakes over the past decade was going full microservice on a spectrum of monolith to microservices. I suggest the following, which is monolith is greater than apps, is greater than services, is greater than microservices. And then he has a a lot of different thoughts. And I had a conversation earlier this week, which will come out following this, with, again, I mentioned his name earlier, Benji from Pants Build. And we kind of talked a little bit about it too there, where the, the way the structure of your code works, it can just lead to such complexity as far as like being able to test this and build it and and you know look at all these kind of weird little problems that kind of come up and even just sort of uh structurally you know for for the team i can kind of see how it could in an organization <laughs> lead to these weird little fiefdoms as far as like who's in charge of what services and so forth which i can imagine being another level of complexity I, I think it's uh, particularly with the the advent of a lot of agile methodologies where we try to build small teams, and I think there's a lot of advantages to doing that. Having that small team be responsible for a chunk of code and not have to talk to another team when they make a decision, it, there's an advantage to that. Okay. And so ar- architecturally, what you're doing is you're drawing a box and you're saying, okay, you get to do whatever you want inside of this box. And in and in some organizations, that includes pick your own language. What's the, What language makes the most sense for your box? And then when your box needs to talk to another box or you need to change how your boxes are going to talk, then you have to get reps from both of the groups who are talking to each other and you have to get like an architect involved or something like that. But you can do all of this inside, well, most of it inside of a monolith. Where And I think one of the reasons microservices was really attractive to people at the beginning is it enforces discipline because your interface to that other box is an API. You're not allowed to shortcut 
into and skip the three calls for security, <laughs> you have to call the API. Whereas in the monolith, you might be able to go, oh, I know that there's this double underscore attribute over there and I can just go and get it. And then the next uh, thing you know, shortcutting. I, I've shortcut something and then the person responsible for that attribute who wanted it to be private goes and changes it and my code's breaking. So, yeah. so there's very well-defined boundaries in this. And you can have those well-defined boundaries in a monolith system but it requires discipline and the the question then becomes is the cost of that discipline more than the cost of the uh, complication that goes to a microservice architecture and and when do you sort of shift from one to the other yeah well that takes us into projects and i guess i'll go first since you kind of led that whole section <laughs> and my project is kind of small and it's almost sort of a topic in and of itself but uh recently hey surprise things are weird at twitter right now <laughs> and uh, a lot of people have been looking at other potential solutions for communicating on the internet twitter wasn't much of a tool until i decided to get more into development and i created a, a new account on it and moved away from the other stuff that i was doing and i just kind of like focused on new stuff i don't really promote it a lot on here but and it's been a good resource to find guests, communicate with people, kind of see, you know, put your finger in the air and kind of figure out which way things are blowing in some ways as far as community stuff. But it has just gotten to be a mess, as a lot of people know. And so I have, along with a lot of other people, been checking out Mastodon. And the thing that I wanted to share, well, there's a Talk Python episode that is kind of interesting because they brought in a bunch of people that have been using Mastodon a little bit longer than Michael himself had. And so there's some interesting discussions there, but one of the things that kind of came out of the discussion that I found very interesting is just the basis of what Mastodon's built on. And maybe this is old news for people that have been, you know, checking this stuff out for a while. But for me, I had heard the term activity pub, which is what Mastodon sort of built upon, but I didn't really understand actually how long it's been around and what the types of things that it can allow that go beyond just it being like sort of like a Twitter, like functioning microblog service. Activity Pub is a W3C recommendation and it dates from January of 2018. So it's been around as a standard and is recognized by the W3C. So that's good as far as it having some background and 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 being around. And I'll include links to a lot of the stuff if you want to learn a little bit more about it, but there's server-to-server -server interactions. I'm talking about microservices here. <laughs> but in this case, these are services that you're not in charge of, which could be good or bad in some ways. But the thing that I found kind of cool about it is that there are examples of all kinds of other projects that can be done other than just a microblog. There's like um, a source for photo sharing, so kind of like an Instagram, things for doing, like, I guess there's one called Bookworm, which is sort of like a Goodreads or whatever. So lots of these other example types of uh, sites that you might be familiar with that can use that same activity pub service. And so I think it's a neat area if you're interested in creating tools and development. I have a couple of additional links that I'll share that kind of dive into this. Um, one. Christopher just shared with me this morning, which is from Andy Piper, that is called a Mastodon Opportunity for Developers. And I agree that this is a really great place to look at, like kind of consuming APIs and interacting with APIs and playing around with your own code. I found a particular very simple API kind of interaction command line tool that I guess it has a TUI also. It's called Toot, just T-O-O-T which you can pip install and kind of check out. And that would be nice if you just want to like do like quick and simple posts inside of there. And so more than anything as a project, I just want people to kind of see a bunch of these potential areas that you could kind of play around inside of this thing. In general, I went ahead and joined a particular instance that I saw Brett Cannon, a handful of other people kind of following on. Um, the one I use is Fostodon, F-O-S-S-T-O-D-O-N. And um, I'll include my link on there if you're interested in following me there. But I immediately, when I went there, it was just like 
kind of relaxing. <laughs> it was just like fairly calm people, you know, having conversations with each other and sharing information. And it was very not Twitter like. Maybe it misses some of the things of like ongoing news and other things that you may want to find. So you might have to find another resource for something like that if that's what you were using it for. But again, I was using it mostly for communications and kind of seeing what's happening within the Python community. And so uh, I found this as a, a useful place. You do, there are a bunch of tools out there for, you know, helping you kind of follow the people that that you might have used on another service. And I'll include some links for that sort of stuff too. There's a, a good blog post from Simon Willison, um, who was actually on that conversation on Talk Python. More than anything, it's just I wanted to share some resources for people as my project this week where people can look if they were using Twitter a lot, that this is a, a good place that you can kind of learn a little more about what's going on. I'm not sure if I'm going to do a, a specific Mastodon focused episode. Um, I feel like there's plenty of resources here for people to kind of dig in. Um, what's your project this week? This is something called Quick Ad, and it's an open source project from a company. And I'm going to guess at the pronunciation here, Acrium. They build a developer-oriented task and knowledge management tool, and there's a bunch of date stuff inside of it. And Quick Add is a fork of another library called CT Parse, which was uh, is originally by David Batista. So both Quick Add and CT Parse are natural language parsing libraries for date information. Okay. So, for example, uh, you can use the phrase "beer Thursday at four. And it will turn that into an interval object that specifies the date and time of the event. And it also handles duration. So like I want to say beer in four hours will give you like a countdown kind of thing that four hours from now. So CT Parse processes both German and English at the moment, and it's built in a way that you could add other languages if you wanted to. It uses essentially a series of regular expressions and then a rule decorator that ties the regexes to the resulting objects. You don't need to understand any of that to use this, but uh, it was kind of it's it's in the documentation. It's kind of interesting how they approach the problem. Nice. What Quick Add provides on top of CT Parse is more rules and recurring events. So this allows you to process things like beer daily at 4 p.m. And it understands grouping phrases like weekdays. Uh, there's also some additional features for handling the differences between the U.S. and your European style dates. So, you know, 5-3 could be March 5th or May 3rd, depending on where you're coming from. And so you can annotate your parsing to tell it, I'm, you know, I'm talking to a European, so it's sane rather than the other way around. I got to get in my American dig. It's it's a Canadian requirement. <laughs> uh, Google Calendar kind of has this feature sort of built in. I don't know if you've ever run into it, where if you're writing things time like descriptions in a calendar event, uh, it automatically adjusts the time of the event for you. So if you're looking for something similar to provide for your users, uh, these two libraries are worth checking out. Yeah, that seems like such a great tool that you can go into a calendar and just, especially with other things maybe feeding into it, like the idea of natural language. Yeah. You know, processing or even voice processing. Yeah, you know, being able to spit into it. Yeah, you you get into the um, you know, like I I think Gmail had. I don't know if it still has it. For a while there, they had some things like if you put certain phrases in into your email that you could get like yeah. a button that was oh I got to turn this into an event kind of thing, right? So it it, it handles that kind of yeah. Throw it in your calendar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I I I definitely like the. <laughs> sometimes it was always such a thing of like how do i need to speak in order yes for this thing yes there's always understand. that yeah yeah and yeah. regexes are not going to be that's it's not like it's full nlp you have to have to match right. the uh, match the phrase i suspect it probably works far better if you're uh doing specific processing as in give me a window where i can type something in rather than uh, if you try to run that over large bodies of text you're going to get a lot of false positives i suspect yeah <laughs> totally Awesome. Well, thanks again for bringing in all these articles and goodies this week. Always fun. All right. And don't forget, easy to start and scale, InfluxDB time series platform is available in the cloud, on premises, or locally. Get started for free today at influxdata.com. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, 
remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.